So thank you so much for joining everybody. And particularly thank you, Ross, for, for doing this to us. Uh, we're really pleased and we hope, like you said, that we'll see you in real life soon. So you're a consultant a pediatric surgeon at the Sheffield Children's Hospital, isn't that so? That's and correct. you are going to lecture about lecturing, how we can make our lectures more interesting. So please, Ross, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Cecilia. It's a pleasure to see uh, lots of lovely people, some of whom I've met in real life, some of whom I've seen in the virtual reality. And um, I am going to, I'm not going to lecture, I'm going to help you to think about the science of presentations and why they fail. Um, my experience of uh, Zoom is that this can be very good. Uh, it can also have some technical issues, so we'll see how we get on with that. I will finish on time. And I know as an anaesthetist, you find that bizarre that a surgeon may actually do that, but there you go. Let me change your mind on surgeons. Um, what I want to do is to start with uh, some slides, not because I necessarily feel they're important, but I think there's a, a value in doing that. And um, I'm hoping that that works. Uh, you should be seeing a slide with an abstract on it. What I want you to consider is how evidence-based is your practice? How evidence-based is your anesthetic and intensive care practice, in fact? And that's what I want to start with and not with presentation skills. This trial itself doesn't matter. I can see Per Christian is reading it avidly. But what I'd like you to do is to get a piece of paper and a pen, ideally, and write down the answer to this question. I, I'm assuming that uh, most of you would undertake an anesthetic on someone of this age. I tried not to make it too specific. A 17-year-old male with a clinical diagnosis of appendicitis. He has no previous medical history or medication whatsoever. I tried to make him a fit Scandinavian, so he plays ice hockey for his local team without difficulty on a regular basis, suggesting that he's pretty cardiovascularly stable. He's not had any vomiting. I don't know what investigations you would do, but he has a normal clinical chemistry and hemoglobin. Please write down, and I mean write down, your anesthetic plan. I'll give you one minute to write down a fairly general anesthetic plan. What I want you to be is specific. I don't know the words, but how are you gonna make them go to sleep? How are you gonna keep them asleep? How are you gonna wake them up? And what pain relief are you going to give them? But be absolutely specific about how you're going to do that. So you should have about four or five steps there. Are you tubing them? Are you doing what? I don't know, because I don't do this stuff. Um, a friend of mine says, if we get good at presentation skills, that's by watching. And I watch anesthesia the whole time. So basically, I should be good at anesthesia. Quick anesthetic plan. Write down what you're going to do for this kid. Or if you are so senior that you would not anesthetize him, what would you be expecting your resident, chief resident, attendings to be doing? So you should have a plan. And I will wait. Now, what intrigues me is uh, that I hear my anesthetic colleagues discussing with their junior staff as I'm operating the justification for various steps in the procedures that they are doing, their anesthetics. And I am amazed that for the same patient, it is likely that we've probably got about 30 different approaches and there aren't even 30 people in the room. And how you would each justify that on the basis of your training, your experience, and your education. What I would like you to consider is what is the evidence base for those steps that you've written down? Are you able to give me a randomized controlled trial, uh, at least a review paper, or something that justifies your choice of that anesthetic? those different steps of um, putting the patient to sleep, keeping them asleep, waking them up, and post-operative pain relief. I'm not doing that 
to, I'm not going to ask anyone to share it, but what I want you to be aware of is that often when people start to address issues of science, we're not necessarily able to quote Kumar A. et al. Critical Care Medicine 2006, 34, 15, 89 to 15, 96 to justify a lot of what we do. And it's not necessarily as evidence-based as we'd like to think it was, but what are the results of what you do? Are you comfortable with the outcome of your anesthesia? And how do you know that? What sort of review do you have of what you have done for the last 100 appendicectomies on 17-year-old boys? And knowing how good it is for what you actually do. Because what I would like to challenge you is that I don't think most of us are as evidence-based as we like to think that we are. And one of the difficulties I find when I start to challenge people on their presentation skills and ask about evidence base is that they say, oh, you know, show me the evidence. I'm asking you to show me the evidence for what you do for simple general anesthesia. And actually, I don't think we do that. I think we use a lot of our own personal insight and experience and a degree of critical appraisal. But we have to accept that there is a huge variation in the 20 odd people here in what they do for anesthesia. And my question then comes to what are your presentations like? And why do we present the way that we do? Now, my experience of many, many, many presentations is that the vast majority of people, despite there being a huge possibility of variation, do exactly the same thing. Now, it might look slightly different with the Karolinska Institute icon down one bottom corner and um, the Institute for Copenhagen and in other hospitals. Most of you have stopped using Microsoft Blue Wave, but what we are doing is killing people with bullet points, reading them out to people with horrible, complex slides and just plowing on through. But what I'd like you to write down now is why do you present the way that you do? Now, it may be because you've seen me doing a presentation and you've studied this and you've gone on and changed your practice. It may be that you do just because, you do what you do because that's what your professor told you 20 years ago when you still do it. It may be you don't actually know, but write that down. The reason I'm asking you to write things down is that there is a permanent record now of your opinion. And it helps you to think differently. Analog record is different to a digital record. And for those of you who have not bothered writing it down, I'd like to challenge you as to why you haven't done that. Interesting, isn't it? Are you just listening along or are you actually writing things down? Why do you present the way that you do? And I want you to consider that because I would suggest that a presentation skill is not something that we're born with. It is not something that we learn simply by copying, but it is a skill as much as intubation. And yes, I can intubate. I'm not very good at it, but I know how to hold a laryngoscope, where to look, and actually I'm fairly successful at intubating when I do it. I do it once a year to try and maintain my skills in the company of consultant anesthetists because the chance might happen and it's good to be at practice. Why do you present the way that you do and how have you developed that skill? Sometimes people say, oh, I actually did go on a presentation skill course for three hours. And yet it is a fundamental and essential part of our education and communication and most of us just do it the way we do because everybody else does. And that's not how you deliver your anesthetics. I'd like to use this concept for describing presentations. It's something I came up with when I was waiting for an anesthetist. I was waiting for her in a coffee shop, not for her to anesthetize a patient, but she was half hour late. And I came up with this concept that a presentation is made up of three parts, a presentation, a presentation, and a presentation. Now, I appreciate that you amazing people are listening to me in English and not in the many languages that you speak. 
but this works really well. The concept that a presentation is made up of three parts. The first presentation is your message. Whatever it is that you want to share with your audience, whether that is rapid sequence induction, the use of antibiotics for um, chest infections, or the fourth quarter business plan. P1 is your message. P2 is your supportive media. Whatever it is that adds to your message, whether that's as PowerPoint or visual aids or video or nothing at all. P1 is your message, P2 is your supportive media, and P3 is your delivery of that. This is the concept that I came up with, and actually I find it's a very valuable way of looking at any presentation. And that any presentation is the product of these three parts. It's the product of your message, your media, and your delivery. And together, that's what I call the P-cubed concept of presentations the product of the message, the media, and the delivery. And however good any one of them is, is in the opinion of the audience, not of the person delivering it. Message, media, and delivery. What I want you to consider now is adding into that this virtual uh, presentation issue that we have. We've been doing this now for about 18 months, where uh, we have uh, a multitude of faces on a screen and someone talking to us. But what I'd like you to consider is what is wrong with presentations? Because this first presentation, I'm going to deal with the science. And the reason that presentations and online presentations suck is science. Presentations suck because of science. What I'd like you to write down is what do you hate about presentations? Whether it's the message, the media, or the delivery. And rather than me tell you all the bits that are wrong, what I'd like to do is go through things that you think are a problem with presentations, and I will share with you some of the science behind why that is a problem, and explain to you, therefore, why Science is the cause of presentations failing, and I am clear about that, not just opinion. So it's not opinion about what I think about icons or the use of video or anything, but I will share with you the science. Not individual references, because that's not what this is all about in the same way that your anesthesia isn't, but describe the science behind the problem. So, Please write down things that upset you, annoy you, cause you to be angry, or cause presentations to fail in terms of P1, the message, P2, delivery, and P, so P2, the media, and P3, delivery. And then I will take offers from the chat and discuss those around the various issues. So you have two minutes. Write down what is wrong with the way the message is set up. What is wrong with the way media is used? And what is wrong with the delivery of that? Go.
Okay. Now this is the challenge of technology. So I'm going to stop the share and have a look in the chat. P1. So if you want to pop anything into this that will help, and I can scroll through it and try to uh, get some understanding of what's going on. Uh, and I can see uh, all the chats that have gone in. But let's deal with P1, the message. Uh, mass, one-way communication for a Christian. Read and listen at the same time, not possible. Um, a message there, Teresa, a message that is well-known without new interesting content. <laughs> You're the rock star when delivering, sitting down when you tear the strings off your guitar. <laughs> Scary stuff. Okay. The biggest problem with the message, P1, is that we firmly believe that we are learning. The evidence shows that we are not. Now that is really, really simple, fundamental, and almost completely ignored. I'll say that again. We firmly believe that someone reading to us, they are teaching and we are learning. And there is virtually no evidence to support any of that in any way. Simple, fundamental. We do not download data like a computer. It is not that you have a USB bolt in the back of your head and that the presenter downloads the information such that at the end of the download, let's call it a presentation, you have, first of all, retained that information or done anything with that. Now, let's break that down. Firstly, the evidence shows that we can, if we struggle, and I mean struggle, retain about seven new items of information in our short-term memory. Now, the average presentation over a 10-minute period is expected to deliver over 200 individual data points. 200. Now, if you work really, really hard at that, it is possible, as I said, that you may be able to retain seven new data points. But the important thing about those seven data points is that they are unlikely to be connected. Sometimes what I do is I will... Uh, put pi on the screen, the, the irrational number, um, and get people to um, tell me what they know of pi. It's 3.14159265358979323846264338. Now, our experience of medical presentations is that actually what would normally happen is that that would go on the screen behind me and then we would all read along together. And often people will nod as people move through lists of facts and data and understanding you know, the six complications of rapid sequence induction using cold fluids. I don't know. 3 so I've now repeated that for you twice. I've emphasized it. I may even deliver it with a degree more passion where I hold it behind the screen and use expression 3.141592653. Does that work for you? And yet, this is the foundation of virtually all teaching, that we put lists of facts up and we read them out to people. Now, here's a challenge. Most of you actually have probably disbelieved what I've said. First of all, can anyone write down pi to more numbers than they did before? Because I have told you it twice. Or let's do something easier. You must have been to a presentation last week. Yeah, three new facts. Just write down three new facts that you have retained from a new presentation that you went to. And here's the thing, virtually all of you are even struggling to remember the presentation, let alone the three new facts. Because the evidence will show that we can retain three facts 
in our short-term memory. And the only way we add that to long-term memory is by processing, but virtually none of us do that. And the reason that we don't do that is because of the constant flow of information. So if I was to say to you, I will give a thousand euros to anyone who can remember pi to more numbers than they know now by three new digits, most of us could do that. But not at the same time as everything else going on. Because to retain those facts, you have to process and you have to stop all the flow of information. Now, how we do that is challenging. But if you think about a presentation in which someone delivers something to you that is new, controversial, or difficult, and you want to process and say, well, wait a second, I need to get something from over here to go back to, I thought that, and then something here, and then you can put those two together and process to get to the point at which you say, excuse me, Mr. Fisher, I would like to challenge that. What you have not done is continue with the information that's carrying on. We have to process in a linear structure. And one of the hardest things that we do is process text. Because text overwhelms our brain. I don't know about you, but anytime I go to a foreign country, I look at text. I'm interested by it. When I go to Sweden or Denmark or Finland or Stockholm or Iceland, I look at text and I speak none of your languages. I can say tak, tusen tak. But more than that, I'm looking for patterns. I'm trying to make sense of stuff. And we do that subconsciously so that if I put text up in front of you, as I did intentionally with those first slides, I know that virtually all of you read the slides while I was talking. And they had nothing whatsoever to do with what I was talking about because we are challenged by facts. And some of you will have gone, well, why is he talking about this? And we get that conflict of text and auditory input. And amazingly, you are listening to me in a foreign language. So you're doing three things at once. You're reading, you're listening, and you're processing a foreign language. And what you are not doing is processing the information. Because if you do, then you have to stop the flow of information. And this is what is called cognitive load. Simple psychological fact. Does anyone know pi to more numbers than they did before? No. Does anyone retain three numbers? Not at all. And the real difficulty is when you recognize that you do not learn in that way. Most of us have a sort of guilt feeling that it's just me that's stupid, that Cecilia is great at this and Joachim, he's probably picked it all up and Joanna, definitely, she's clever. She's learning all that information. But none of us, not one, retains information in that way. And that's really, really upsetting. Because when you realize that you as a learner have not done that, and then you look around and see all those other learners have failed to do that, then first of all, none of us have retained any of that information. And we've given an hour, let's say, to a lecture on uh, anesthesia for um, a tracheosophageal fistula in newborn infants. And we think we've got something, we've heard stuff, we like to process it, but you can't retain it. And the corollary is also true that those lecturing us believe that they have delivered that information. Now that's like buying something from Amazon, putting in 4,000 euros from your account, which disappears, and Amazon saying they've delivered it, but nothing turns up at your house. The reason nothing turns up is because you are not able to process in that way. Science to support that is overwhelming. 3.141592653589793223. It could be any list, any lecture. You do not download information and retain it in the way that we deliver it. Now, does anyone have any questions on that? Put it into the chat or Open up, put your hand up, and we can start a discussion. Silence stunned you all. 
Now, the important thing, going back to why I challenged you about your anesthesia, is it's not about getting me to list the papers. I can list the papers. That is not what's going to change you. It's your own personal experience in the same way of delivering your anesthetic that you know there is some background to this, but you don't necessarily are able to quote the papers. Per Christian, did you have something or you just turned your camera on? Well, actually, I just turned my camera on, but I totally agree with a lot of things you say because you've been been teaching me in, in this. <clears throat> and it's, um, I think that the, the most striking point for me is that uh, I'm a very simple person, probably, but I'm not able to read text and listen to language. I can listen to music, but I cannot listen to the spoken word and the written word at the same time. Okay. You are not simple. You're, first of all, you are wise, and I know this to be the case. But there are many of us. I've had a woman in tears at the end of one of my presentations. Uh, you know, I was terrified I'd done something horrible to her. And she came and she said, you are the first person who has explained to me why I have felt so bad in presentations for all of my professional career. She said, I thought everyone else was learning, and I never did. And all I had done was explain the science, that we do not learn in that way. Now, one of the big problems of me having said this is that a lot of you are trying to justify this. But that's why I asked you simply to remember the last lecture you were at and three facts. The implications of what I've told you are horrendous. And we'll come back to that. But that doesn't stop them being true. You not knowing the science doesn't change the reason you are no longer giving chloroform anesthesia. It used to work. But you not knowing why is not an, ex not an excuse of why it doesn't happen. Cecilia is asking, is disappointing, what should we do? That's the next lecture. <laughs> I'm not giving away any secrets. I'm hoping that you will be challenged, that you will be excited, that you'll be uh, upset, in denial, angry, whatever, but at least we've got some interaction. Now, is that IB? PowerPoints are often just for the lecture to remember what they want to talk about. Absolutely. Very sadly, they are also for the audience, and we'll come to that when we discuss the media. They're also for the audience because, like per Christian, what most audience members do is this. They blank out the speaker so they can read because they don't want those two inputs. And for some reason, our audience believe this is the only way to get information. And if it was, just email it to them. It's quicker, it's more efficient, you can put more on the page, and they can read it at their leisure rather than wasting their time sat there listening. Okay, any more questions about P1 and the science? Because what I'm telling you is essential that you get it. It's as bad as using chloroform anesthesia, and I know how bad that is. Simply reading stuff out to people or extemporizing through your bullet points does not work. Okay? It does not work. However much that upsets you does not change the science. How can we change? That's, that's the next lecture. I was told to give two, and I want to challenge you. Any more about P1? Put your hand up, ask a question. I'm sorry I've, I've upset people, but that's what this is all about. Okay, so I'll summarize that. P1 is your message, and the evidence that is overwhelming in the psychological and the educational literature is that we do not retain information in the way we currently deliver it. Okay, writing it down helps a little, but if you're writing, you are no longer in the flow of the information that comes, and you've disconnected from, as Per Christian pointed out, the speaker. And if we don't want the speaker, then that's a document. If we want a document, we should email it to people. But even if you get a document with 200 information points in it, you will not retain those unless you study, get context, and process. And I'll come back to that further down the line. Okay. The second part of a presentation is what I call the supportive media. And there is a lot in the supportive media that inhibits our learning. What things do people get upset with or not like 
in supportive media in the slide where pop that into the chat and i can have a discussion about that go for anything don't just be as bland as you want specific things i can help with whilst you're doing that i will tell you that they have stopped doing research on bullet points 20 years ago the literature was already full of the evidence that shows that bullet points inhibit your learning Every time you do a presentation with bullet points on it, you make it harder for your audience to learn anything. Research is overwhelming, qualitative and quantitative. It inhibits learning. The best thing, and most people will recognize that, is when the professor turns up, she can't get her slides to work, so she just talks to you. And they go, that was amazing, because she is looking down the barrel of the camera and communicating with you, rather than reading out the bullet point list behind you. So per Christian, try to get in there. Kaplan Meyer. Okay, Stefan, tell us about Kaplan Meyer. That's not a, there's lots of things that Kaplan Meyer talk about, and I am no expert in these things. Wait for Kaplan Meyer. So please feel free to open the microphone on cameras and talk. This should be as interactive as we can make it. Okay, so Ib has said, my problem is that PowerPoint makes me use PowerPoint. It's too easy to use. Absolutely. And this is a big problem that we have both as educators and the educated, that uh, we, as someone pointed out earlier, that we feel we need them because there are scripts, there are uh, supportive media, there are download, and our audience feel they need them because they're going to take them away and study from them later. So my best advice is cut out the middleman and just email them that document. Uh, reading it out to them is actually very bad and it makes things worse. And the answer is it's almost like a drug. As the presenter, we're addicted to the smack of reading out our bullet points because we don't prepare and we just type it straight in there. And our audience are junkies. They don't prepare either. And they just want that download into the back of their brain. And if it comes in bullet points, it's much easier for them. Right. Teresa, how about pictures or figures? Do they support the message? They can do, Teresa. They can, absolutely. Um, I um, often, um, people will say, oh, Ross talks about just using pretty pictures, which upsets me that my 10 years of work has come to people saying just use pictures, but there is more to it than that. Pictures and good quality pictures will focus someone and allow you to concentrate differently on an image or an analogy more than text will. If I was to say an example I often use is a glass slipper, most of us will be able to start to reconstruct some story from that simple two words, glass slipper. And that is a useful educational tool that you can use to, I don't know, base your discussion over rapid sequence induction or the use of anxiolytics or whatever. If you can reconstruct Cinderella from two words, imagine if you could reconstruct Per Christian's lecture from an image. So images are useful as long as they are simple, bled to the edge of the screen so they don't distract you, and high quality, and that they make sense. They have to make sense for the lecture and for the audience. And one of the big problems is like memes, where we use something that works for me, and I'm old, and it doesn't work for a young person. I'm really grateful that they're reissuing the Matrix movie because I can reuse this uh, meme, whereas 20 years ago, some people didn't understand it. It has to work for the audience. So when I talked about the glass slipper, I, one of my colleagues is Indian, and he said, I'm sorry, what is that? And he has no kids, and he'd never seen Cinderella. So you have to remember that images will work for individuals, but not necessarily for everyone. Uh, Figures can be exceptionally distracting. Let me show you uh, an image. This is a simple image, but is in fact very complex. And most of us are already staring at it. 
And when we stare at it, we get confused by different things. There's one of them, which is empty. There's one woman who appears to be staring over somebody's shoulder. There's a group of two, and they've both got wine glasses. And now you are scanning the image, so you're no longer focused with me. So we have to recognize that images can be very problematic, that they can distract us. Um, the problem with complex images such as this is that our attention is drawn to the five images that you can see on the screen and we will start to consider it in different ways. Now, we have this habit of putting up images, what is a critical care unit? If you're talking to people about what a critical care unit is and they don't know that that's what it looks like, you shouldn't be putting that sort of image up. Most of you are probably interrogating uh, the images and figuring out that that's some form of ECMO machine. And any of you who are experts in ECMO will have a, an opinion about whether it's old or young or uh, where it is and who's been using it. And now you're no longer paying attention to me and what I'm talking about and whether the critical care unit is important or otherwise. And we get, cons we get um, attracted to different parts of the image. If I ask you to close your eyes and then open them and look at the image, I know that all of you are looking at the blonde woman on the left because we're attracted to faces. We make sense of it. Now you're all looking at her face. Uh, and these psychological principles affect how we understand a message that is being delivered to us. And it's important that we recognize that there is a lot more complexity to what we put on a screen or what we put on a, a virtual screen than simply an image. And that even the moving image that we've got here can be very distracting. What I usually do is have people turn their video off because if per Christian is suddenly to drop down and come back again, having dropped a pen, we'll be distracted. I'm distracted that he's now inside and has changed his jacket. And I picked up on that whilst I was discussing. I'm intrigued by what's behind Cecilia and how on earth uh, Stefan is halfway up that wall wherever he is. And I'm hoping it's not the Holocaust uh, Memorial in Berlin. All of these images have an input in our brain and stop us processing in the same way as we would do otherwise. It's important that we recognize all of these have an impact on how we interpret images that are going on. What other questions do people have? Masters, how do we develop a culture of presenting in public in general? I have a feeling it is trained in the US in school while it's not a thing here. Well, that's good to know, Mass, that it's not a culture for, um, for Denmark. It is the culture in the rest of the world. Everyone does this to the point at which if you turn up to give a presentation without slides and bullet points, people will actually think you are poor and not as educated as you should be. Some people think that, you know, their kudos gets to be on the wall behind them. Here are a list of references I've used, therefore I'm academic. So there are problems with our supportive media that affect our interpretation. A perfect example of the complexity of that is a data slide. Um, So we go to conferences and someone's talking about the crash two trial with the use of, oops, <laughs> the crash two trial with the use of um, tranexamic acid. Uh, see how it keeps fading away? That's because I've told it to fade away. <laughs> I don't want it to fade away. The use of um, complex text means that you're immediately just going to read it, even though I'm not using it. And the idea that it's important is implanted in our brain because it has appeared. So now we're reading it. Cecilia is desperately trying not to read it at the same time as looking at me. And it's really hard not to look at text because it draws us to it. Now, this is a perfect example of complexity. And whilst it has value, and maybe I wanted to talk about Barker, Jay, and whatever, and fill you in on that, the use of the table behind us, it immediately you know it's going to disappear. You're trying to read what's behind it. We want to make sense of images and text because they fill our lives. And if something appears in front of us, we will focus our attention on it. And that attention is even more than listening to the person who's there. Complex data tables, people try to make less complex by 
by putting red boxes around them. And when we do that, what that forces people to do is look outside the red box. Now, the evidence shows that we can concentrate for three seconds and get the impact, intent, and meaning of an image. So if you flash an image up, people will see it, understand it, and then they can come back to listening to what you're talking about. But also, if you leave that image up for longer than 30 seconds, they will start to interrogate it further. So that I can look at uh, Ib and I can see he's in a chair, I can see his headphones, but I'm intrigued to know what that window is behind him because he looks like he's in the attic. And now the walls are slightly different and I'm confused about what angle and see how we're all now looking at that and distracted despite the fact that I'm talking. The supportive media should add to a presentation, but virtually always, the way we use it, it is exceptionally distracting. What I say to people is you should never have a, in your presentation anything that has come directly from a document, whether that's a data table or a graph or anything like that, because they are designed for an entirely different medium. Now, if you have um, a data table and you've got the, the journal in front of you, you can sit down and do the math and figure out things and see things which are interesting and choose the bit that's important to you. But if it's on a slide or worse, on the screen in front of you on your laptop, it will entirely distract you for reasons that are just because we read. And so if you want people to simply concentrate on the risk of vascular occlusive events in the CRASH-2 trial, don't put other things up because other people will read. And that's not them being clever. That's not them looking for flaws. That's them not paying attention. And as the presenter, it's our job to lead them in a direction. If you want them to interpret the whole paper, give it to them. Because even Professor Woodcock, who's just come online and I've seen him, clever as he is, he cannot do both of those things at once. And if you're doing two things, you're not listening. And the point of me being here is immediately moot. Uh, no, what did he say? I just saw him come up. Someone listened to music while learning. I listened, I learned basic German in a class that used music to facil facilitate the learning process. I know thousands of song lyrics because I sing them. Uh, thoughts on the use of music? Tom, thank you for that. I think there is value in learning and the use of adjuncts that we can tie things onto. And I do think that uh, Music is useful when we are studying to blank out other inputs so that we can focus in a way. And it does allow us to learn in different ways. And it is intriguing that if I ask most people to write down the lyrics to their favorite song, they wouldn't be able to do it, but turn the music on and they would sing along without challenge and know the words. So we have a, a different way of learning. And a lot of what I have discovered in presentation skills is actually coming back to learning and seeing how we do it differently. And in fact, how we do it wrong. And there are many, many books that are very useful on showing us about how bad our understanding of learning and teaching is compared to what we should be doing. I'm not sure that in a presentation there is a huge value in using music, but yeah, I think so. It gives something that will tie people to that. But remember, like we talked about memes, if it's something that works for them, it may work for different reasons. So um, let's just say Beethoven's Fifth, they may have the knuckles rap because they constantly got it wrong playing first violin and they're upset by it, whereas someone who's never heard it just gets emotive and someone who uh, doesn't understand classical music may find it odd and confusing. So as a teacher, it's different than as a learner and we are offering people a direction rather than forcing them in a direction. Does anyone have any other questions about the science of supportive media and why it is a problem? So what you're actually saying is that we should, it's Eve. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So what you're actually saying is that we need, need to use much more energy to prepare a lecture, uh, to prepare the slides as we has done before, because it's much more easier just to copy paste something from an article and put a ring in it uh, rather than just to prepare it in a way that it's much more teachable moment. So I need to much yeah. use much more energy to prepare a lecture. I cannot do it 10 minutes before the actual lecture. 
it is a sad recognition. You're absolutely right, Eve, that people will just recognize that it's easy just to type it straight into bullet point and then to read it out to people. Uh, so that to do more than that takes more effort. Here's the question. Is education worth the effort? I actually think we all believe that it is. And if you recognize how little has been retained by what you've done in the past, then you'll start to put more effort into making it better. Now, it's not a criticism of the past. It's simply not understanding the science of why it's been a problem. But yes, it takes more effort to do that than simply typing it straight into bullet point. Uh, Mass says, outside slides, any opinion on physical props, such as use of chalkboard, generating the content during the talk. I think that's very useful, Mass. There's uh, one guy on Twitter who is an absolute fiend for the um, flip chart. <coughs> I think there is value uh, in anything that works differently. And I do think that constructing something in front of people has value uh, as an image. And a lot of us have started to do that with bullet point, where we use animation to construct a complex image from things that come in. Please don't just have text flying in. I will actually hunt you down in your home and do bad things to you if you do that. But uh, or, or otherwise, if anyone talks to me about, um, what's it called? The flying in one? I've even forgotten its name now. Um, but that, that animated PowerPoint thing, then, uh, then that, no, it's not simply about that, but there is value to it. I think a visual aid is what PowerPoint was originally conceived as by many people that would add to what they're saying, but be careful about how we use it. A friend of mine was doing a talk on head injuries. She got up two watermelons and put a, a cycle helmet on one of the watermelons and then got out a baseball bat. Strong visual message. Um, right, I'm gonna move on because it's important that we finish on time. What I've summarized in that is that our supportive media should add to what we are saying, but if it is simply text, if it is complex images or complex graphs, it will distract. And the firm evidence is there that simply text will inhibit the learning in your learners. And as Eep has said, we need therefore to put more effort into our supportive media if you use any. I've hardly used any, I hope you're aware, and some of it is only illustrative. Um, Tom, I'll come back to that at the end on infographics. Okay, so the third thing is, what is wrong with delivery? Chuck stuff into the uh, chat. What things do you think are bad in delivery, whether it's online or in person? Ah, uh, Cecilia, while she's doing that, learning styles. Do I have any comments on learning styles? I do, Cecilia. My comment is they don't exist. It's a common misconception that learning styles exist. The only people who talk about learning styles are medical educators. The evidence for learning styles is that they don't exist. I know we talk about visual learners and auditory learners and tactile learners, and that's all made up. They don't exist and there is no evidence to support the fact that we should use text because people are uh, textual, le textual learners. To get to this stage in our lives, we are what are called blended learners. Some five-year-olds are visual learners and text learners and some are tactile, but for what we do, we are blended learners and there is no evidence to support education learning styles. And in particular, there's absolutely no evidence for changing your presentations to put text up because people are text learners. Uh, okay, so I'm, I've got about four people who are clients. Eep says not looking at the audience. It's difficult, isn't it? It is a real problem because if I do this and talk like that, whilst I'm on screen and you can see me, the value of my message is suddenly decreased. Whereas if I do this and stare down the barrel of the little green dot, even if I say, I am an arrogant fool, it has impact that I am an arrogant fool does not have. Body language and uh, communication skills 
dramatically change the impact of your message. So as Benedict has put, monotonous delivery is destructive. If you read stuff out to people from your text and notes because you are worried, then it will not work at all, full stop. But Benedict, a very bad accent, I would come back to and actually encourage you, particularly as I am suspecting the majority of you have spoken in English not being your first language, and you feel that that makes your delivery poor. You are wrong. The evidence is actually the converse, that native speakers hearing their native language being spoken by a foreigner is valued hugely. And actually, the worse you do it, the more you are loved because they see the effort you have put in to delivering your message and the value you have placed in your audience. The evidence is that we value non-native speakers speaking our language much better than we do that exactly the same delivery in the native language. We love to hear you speak whether it's Dutch or Swedish or Danish or Finnish or Icelandic or Portuguese or Indian. That's where it comes from. Uh, lack of rehearsal, heavens. That is the worst thing, isn't it? Because lack of rehearsal means you're not prepared. And for an anesthetist, you have plan A, plan B, plan C, and probably plan F for your anesthetic in terms of difficult airways. Why we don't have that for a presentation when there might be 2,000 people in the audience and an essential message to deliver is beyond me. I think, sadly, it's because we don't value presentations in the same way. And most of us know we can just read it out. So put slides up and read them out to people. And then when that doesn't happen, or worse, they change your screen so that the presenter notes aren't available, then you're suddenly in the deep blue sea without a life vest. Walking into the audience for several face-to-face -face exchanges gets their attention. You ever use that? I have done that a little, Tom. Um, a friend of ours, uh, Simon Carley, did that at, um, I think, in fact, the, the, the lecture, I was one of the lectures after I first presented with Per Christian in the audience. It terrified the audience. <laughs> so, yes, you can do it. Um, it is different, and uh, it suddenly makes them feel very difficult. Most of us know that you never sit in the front row of a comedy gig because the comedian will pick on people he knows and people he can see. That's why I've spoken to Mass Cecilia Ibb um, per Christian, because I can see their faces. And in a scientific lecture, when the professor gets off stage with a microphone in their hand, you can tell people are going to be terrified. So I think you're right, Tom, it does get people's attention. But as educators and learners, we have to be careful that me humiliating Mass in front of his peers, because either he wasn't paying attention, he was on his phone texting uh, because his son has been ill, or he actually doesn't understand, will <laughs> make him turn his camera off. <laughs> uh, it will make people very frightened, and we have to be careful of that. They may not be as receptive as you think they are. Um, so other things about delivery, issues like this, where you're staring at somebody's chest, or worse, the head view, or when the lights go out and it's all bad, that significantly affects your delivery. Yeah, we've got to be able to hear what's going on. Per Christian wanted me to unmute. Thank you for that. The delivery is an essential part of what's going on. We have to recognize that our presentation is a product of our message, our media, and our delivery, and that all three parts play a part in the ultimate result for the audience. You can have a fantastic message and kill it with what's behind you. You can have an amazing message beautifully supportive media, but particularly if your butt keeps breaking and people don't know what's going on. So we have to recognize the three parts of what's going on. It is three minutes to, I am going to summarize and close. I hope you understand that this science is strong about why this is a problem. I can share with you the references if you'd like, but what I suggested to you is that you could not retain facts from a lecture you've been to previously. 
not because you didn't pay attention, not because the presenter didn't care or put in the effort, but because of science. And the science is neatly summed up by Bloom's taxonomy. The basis of Bloom's taxonomy is that learning has knowledge at its foundation. And that's what we seek to share with people. But if your knowledge fails, because we do not download information in the way that we think, then you can have no understanding that is valid. Our analysis, which comes on the basis of our understanding, will be flawed. Above that, we cannot evaluate the impact of what that will have on our future learning, and therefore we cannot create new action. The science of presentation is that it fails because we do not download information in the way that we think we do, because the support of media obstructs it, and because our delivery inhibits it. And that's Bloom's taxonomy. That is why it fails, not because you don't care and not because you don't put the effort in. Now, a meme which I use for this is that we have a belief that as lecturers and educators, we have been educated. And I want to share with you two facts. Reading out PowerPoint is not teaching. I think most of us know that. The corollary of that is that listening to PowerPoint being read out is not learning. And yet that makes up the vast majority of our undergraduate, postgraduate education, either as educators or learners. And what I'm telling you is that it is a virtual reality. You have not been teaching and you have not been learning. The evidence of that is in your life. Deny it, be upset by it as much as you want, but simply because you don't know the science does not change the facts. And this comes from a film, The Matrix, in which Morpheus, the lead character, points out to Neo that the world in which he exists is a virtual reality. And I have done that for you. And like Neo, I, as Morpheus, am offering you a choice. Right now, you have to choose the red or the blue pill. If you choose the blue pill, you can go on believing the world is as you see it. Struggling as you are with what I've said to you, upset by the implications of it, take the blue pill and you can go on believing the world is as it is. Read out PowerPoint to people and believe your teaching and sit there listening and believe that you are learning. I won't be there. Or you can take the red pill. Come with me down the rabbit hole and I will show you how deep this goes and I will help you use science to change the world. Because I firmly believe that every presentation that we do, every teaching session that we do, can change the world of our learners and of us as learners ourselves. So you choose right now, red pill or blue pill? And what Morpheus says to Neo immediately after that is remember, all I am offering you is the truth, nothing more. It's up to you. Thank you, my friends. Thank you. That was really, really overwhelming and nice. And we really got something to think about now, I think. And I can't wait to hear the next part. That's the way it should be. Yes. Uh, so are there other, any more questions? Yeah, I can't see any in the chat. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And thank you in particular, Ross, for taking your time from your precious time with your parents over there. And uh, we're really looking forward to the next lecture. <laughs> Bye, everybody.